Good evening. And welcome to the great debate. Um, I'm Roger Bingham. I'm the director of the Science Network. Um, I think, how, how many of you know about the Science Network? You, many of you have seen the Beyond Belief programs, right? <laughs> well, just off the top of your heads, just a quick response. How many of you think science can tell us right from wrong? And how many of you don't think science can tell us right from wrong? Well, that means that the panel has a little work to do this evening, by the sounds of it, by the sounds of it. When you came in, you were given um, a, a flyer. You also had a question for panelists form in there. If you do have a question for the panelists, would you please think about filling it in as we go through this? And during the intermission, when it comes up, Take it down there to the corner. There'll be a lady standing there. If you give her the questions, then I'll, I will look through them and pick the ones that I think will be least offensive. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I was here last, actually, uh, in, in April last year. I think it was a year ago. Um, for the Origins, the big Origins um, meeting that was put on. Lawrence Krauss, of course, is a member of Science Network's advisory board, a big... Uh, influence on this Origins project, director of the Origins project, and we had enormous fun. You can see all of the Origins stuff on the Science Network, and it was so great to actually be collaborating with, with ASU again. I, I thoroughly admire what this place stands for. Um, there's a long interview with Michael Crow on the Science Network as well, if, if you want to see it. And a number of the people who are going to be um, with us this evening um, were involved in that, in that Origins project as well. So to go from that sort of interdisciplinary thing to now doing something with, 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 the, with the School of Law, the Center for Law, Science, Innovation, um, is, is a great delight. And I'd like to think, thank uh, James Weinstein, Jim Weinstein, for being such a wonderful um, organizing force um, and allowing Science Network to come and poach on his party, which is really nice of you, Jack. Um, I'd also like to thank Simon Blackburn uh, from the University of Cambridge, Faculty of Philosophy, who was one of the organizers. And, of course, um, as I've been instructed by Lawrence Krauss, I have to thank Lawrence Krauss. So this is <laughs> most important. Um, ASU's Origins Project, by the way, is sponsoring this event as part of its ongoing research and public programming uh, to explore all aspects of human and cosmic origins. And um, I, I expect there will be future events, and we're looking forward enormously to doing some of these things. Um, the, 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 the format is that the, the speakers are going to come on and do just a few minutes of a, a, a throw a little bomb amongst you so that it gets you thinking in order, and then we'll have a, an intermission, and then a moderated session afterwards. Um, some of these topics, um, uh, I think, are just hugely important at this point. Um, I'd like to bring the people on um, shortly, but I also want to alert you that there was, in the 16th of October, issue of New Scientist. There was an opinion special. I don't know if any of you saw it. Science wakes up to morality. This is a very timely piece. And it said here, the first paragraph uh, was, morality, um, we've long thought of moral laws as fixed points of reality, self-evident truths, rooted in divine command or in some platonic realm of absolute rights and wrongs. But new research is offering an alternative, explaining moral attitudes in the context of evolution, culture, and the neural architecture of our brains. This apparent reduction of morality to a scientific specimen can seem threatening, but it needn't be. Rather, by unmasking our minds as the authors of morality, we may be better able to bend its narrative arc towards a happy end. You're, you're obviously not convinced from your, from your initial show of hands. Let's see if things change during the course of the, of, of the evening. People are going to come on in, in, in reverse order. So let me now invite uh, the panelists on. Please uh, welcome Stephen Pinker from Harvard University. Simon Blackburn from Cambridge. Uh, Lawrence Krauss from the Director of the Origins Project here at ASU. <laughs> Peter Singer from Princeton.
Patricia Church then from UCSD. And Sam Harris from Project Reason. So, uh, very briefly, so that we can get into the, the uh, most of these people don't, I mean, they don't need an introduction, but just to remind you that, that um, Sam um, had those wonderful bo best-selling books, The End of Faith, Letter to Christian Nation. He has a book out right now called The Moral Landscape. So it seemed very fitting that uh, he sets the stage um, with his PhD in neuroscience as well, um, since we're talking about whether science can do this job, um, and, and get us on the road. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's really an honor to be here and an honor to be in this company, needless to say. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the relationship, as I see it, between science and human values. Uh, and this is the subject of my current book, The Moral Landscape. Now, many people think this relationship is somehow problematic, uh, usually because they think that the universe is parceled into these separate quantities. On the one hand, we have facts, which obviously science can deal with. But on the other, we have values, which inconveniently for us cover the most important questions in human life, and it's thought science really can't touch these. Questions of right and wrong and good and evil, uh, questions about really, the, the, really the, the, que the core issues of how to raise our children, what proper goals we should strive for in life. Uh, and it's thought that while science may be able to help us get what we value, it can never tell us what we ought to value. And I want to kind of push this intuition around because I think this is an illusion. I think the, the split between facts and values is an illusion. And I think it's quite a dangerous one to be taken in by at this moment in human history because it, we're in danger of waking up in a world where the only people who are absolutely sure that moral truth exists will be religious demagogues who think the universe is 6,000 years old. And they'll, they'll be sure that these truths exist because they got them from a voice in a whirlwind. Uh, so I actually think the, the connection between facts and values is actually quite straightforward and philosophically uninteresting. And, and for that reason, we could ignore much of what has been said in moral philosophy over the ages. I think values reduce to facts. They reduce to facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. And if you just imagine a universe where there are only rocks, clearly there, there are no values in this universe. There's nothing that can care about change in the universe. The moment you get conscious minds that can experience change, then we can talk about changes that matter. We can talk about right and wrong and good and evil. We can, we can talk about this because what there is to value are changes in experience, and to the degree that experience can change. So if we, if we care more about our fellow primates than we do about insects, as indeed we do, it's because we believe they're laid bare to a wider spectrum of changes in experience. Uh, and I think we're, we're right to feel that way. Uh, we're, we're right to have our moral intuitions track the possibilities of experience. And if, if you doubt this, I would just ask you to consider, imagine a universe in which every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. Okay, I call this the, the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Now, if, if the word bad means anything, it applies to that situation. Now, if you think that the worst possible misery for everyone might not be bad, or it might be good in the end, or there might be something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and what's more, I'm pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about either. <laughs> now, this, this, it seems to me, is the only philosophical assumption you have to grant me. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad, and everything else, every other possible state of the universe, is better. And given 
that the experience of conscious minds is a natural phenomenon emerging out of the way the universe, the way the universe is, and is, there, is constrained by the laws of nature in some way, then there are going to be right and wrong ways to move along this continuum of possible experience. There are going to be right answers to the question of how to avoid the worst possible misery. And it'll, it'll be possible to be wrong in your efforts to avoid the worst possible misery. And that's all we need for a science of morality. Now, some of you may be concerned that, th that this notion of the, the well-being of conscious creatures is not well-defined enough. Uh, and I get, I get a lot of um, mail along these lines. I get you know, people write me emails saying, well, you're, just, you're saying that well-being is a value, but you haven't proven that it's a value. Uh, and I get emails like, you know, who's to say that if you wanted to torture every conscious being to the point of madness, that's not as good as any other strategy. You, how could you prove that? Um, think by analogy of physical health. Okay, physical health as a concept is very loosely defined. It's a truly elastic concept which changes as we make breakthroughs in medicine. Uh, you, when the statue was carved, life expectancy was 25 or 30. It's now 80. If we ever re-engineer our genomes in such a way as to live to be 1,000, our expectations of health would change markedly, and yet we can have a science of medicine without tying down the definition of health. And what you don't get, you don't, you don't get pushback, skeptical challenges to, to the philosophical foundations of medicine. You don't get people saying, well, who are you to say that health has something to do with living a long life free of pain and debilitating illness? You don't get someone saying, well, how, how would you convince someone with terminal smallpox that he's not as healthy as you are. And yet I, I get precisely this challenge in my, my link between morality and well-being uh, and, my, and my description of a possible science of well-being seems open to the challenge, well, how would you convince a member of the Taliban that throwing battery acid in the face of a little girl isn't good? We, the, we don't have to convince a member of the Taliban of that. We can't convince a majority of the American population that evolution is a fact, and yet, yet biology thrives. Scientific truth is not predicated on convincing everyone. Now, this is true even of the, the least value-laden claims about the nature of reality. Think about water. For 150 years, we've known that water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. What do we do when someone doubts that claim? When someone comes into the room and says, well, that's not how I choose to think about water. Okay. Imagine a, a biblical chemist who comes in and says, well, chemistry for me is whatever fits the book of Genesis. Okay. Well, the, all we can do in that case is appeal to scientific values. The, the, the most basic scientific fact relies on the value of understanding the universe the value of respect for evidence. I mean, what evidence could we put forward? If someone doesn't respect evidence, what evidence could we put forward proving that they should? If someone doesn't respect logical consistency, what logical argument can we put forward? And so too with parsimony and, and intellectual honesty and mathematical elegance and other areas of science. I mean, this is, these are values. Science is in the values business. So the most basic facts about the nature of reality can't be asserted without a tacit appeal to value. So the valuing, uh, avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone doesn't seem like a leap. And clearly there's a continuum of facts that relate most directly to human well-being about which we can, we we can form true or false beliefs. And, and there's something to be understood about how we can escape a failed state, for instance, as Somalia uh, is and was. This, this photo is from the 80s. But, uh, I mean, think of Congo at this moment, where everyone's daily concern is avoiding being raped and killed by drug-addled soldiers. There's, there's something to be understood about how societies fail, about how people fail to collaborate. And movement on that continuum is non-random toward a place very much like the one in which we're living at the moment. And this, the requisites of human well-being can clearly be understood on many levels. We're talking about the genome, we're talking about states of the human brain, and we're also talking about economic systems and political arrangements. But each of these levels 
granted, they're, they're, the, the details are complex, each falls into one of the, the familiar bins of science. We're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. This captures the, the, our possible discussion about the real causes of, of human and animal well-being. And so what I would ask you to consider is a moral landscape where the peaks correspond to the heights of human well-being, to speak of our case, and the valleys correspond to the lowest depths of misery. And one thing to notice is that there may, in fact, be many peaks on this landscape. There may be many equivalent but dissimilar ways to thrive. But there will be many more ways not to be on a peak. I mean, clearly, there, there can still be right and wrong answers about how to move in this space. And when you admit this, you have to admit that some people are wrong about how we should live in this world, which is to say some people care about the wrong things. They care about things that reliably lead to, to needless human misery. And it is not unscientific to say that. To, to, in fact, to withhold that judgment from the point of view of science is, is tantamount to saying we know nothing about human well-being and we, are, we will never know anything about it. And that, I think, is at this moment in history a, an intellectually dishonest thing to do. And I think it's actually a failure of compassion given all of the unnecessary misery in the world. Thank you very much.